<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow Masons, it is with great honor and enthusiasm that I welcome you to the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston Masonic Library Live Lecture. This esteemed institution, steeped in the rich traditions of Freemasonry, has been a beacon of knowledge, enlightenment, and fraternity for almost 175 years. Tonight, we gather in the spirit of curiosity and enlightenment to partake in an engaging lecture that promises to broaden our horizons. And to do our introductions tonight, we have Right Worshipful Rodney Cordo, Cordo, who is the first vice president of the library's trustees. Rodney. Uh, Robert DeCarlo, past Paul and Tate, excuse me, sure. I'm Jim. I'm Jim. I'm Jim. I'm Steve. I'm going to be presenting going up soon. So. Okay. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, okay, so I guess we'll first, let me just make sure these, okay, great. So before we get into what we're gonna be exploring together tonight, uh, I just wanted to let you know that this symbol is actually uh, the original symbol that Robert Morris did for the signet of the Order of Eastern Star. And I received this out of the book, uh, the oranges of the origin of the Eastern Star. And it's out of print, but it was in 1901 to 1912. And so, um, yeah, we're gonna dive into it a little bit later, but this is actually just a snippet of it. I have a bigger, a larger version of it that'll come up a little later. Um, so tonight, gonna talk a little bit about OES before we get into looking at OES. I have moved the triangles to more within the hitting within the star. So we're going to talk about why does New York star point up? I get that question quite often um, in that it's pointing up now as opposed to the original position of pointing down. And we're going to stop for some questions. Then we're going to talk about a little bit about the star points. Get into part one of hitting within the star pause for some questions, get into part two, then we'll do conclusion and final questions. All right, so y'all ready to rock and roll? Okay, <laughs> and actually this is the history of the Order of the Eastern Star by Reverend Willis D. Engel. He was a most worshipful at, uh, and the first grand secretary of the general grand chapter. And this book was published, no, he, yeah, it was published within, between 1901 and 1912. It is currently out of print. Okay, so I'm gonna move into, I'm gonna stop moving forward. So this picture I found, I was like, oh my gosh, because uh, when I look up information about the women who were involved in the Eastern Star, what I generally see is like Mrs. John Smith or Mrs. Robert Mosley. I never see their names. I never see that. 
And what I found out, which I don't know if everyone knew this already, um, but Robert Morris and his wife, Charlotte, she has a name, <laughs> Morris developed the Rosary of the Eastern Star, which uh, was renamed the Constellation of the Adopted Right, concepts and beliefs of which the Order of Eastern Star was actually created. And the degrees of the uh, adoptive right were first conferred by Robert Morris in a lecture forum in New York in 1853. He was doing lectures prior to that in 1850 in other areas and other regions. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit too because there's some questions around, did it start in 1850 somewhere? Did it start here? So we'll dive into all of that. But this picture is for me is very powerful because I actually see a face of a woman that helped to create a woman's organization and she is recognized and it made me proud. It made me even more excited about what I was diving into. And uh, also Robin Morris and his wife were part of the women's suffrage movement. They were very into women's rights back then. And so Eastern Star developing was a big deal because it actually gave women some access to information that their husbands, their, their, their male family members um, had. And basically it's about light and the journey within and how to do, how to, some tools that will help you do the best at that, to get, to the, to get within, to know thyself. Um, so before we move on, I just wanna make sure, okay, yes. When Robert also dived into this, he, in Europe, there were some groups that were allowing women to actually be initiated as Masons back then, believe it or not. So America was kind of a little bit behind and he was inspired by some of that that he was hearing about. He was also in desire of balance within the lodge rooms. And balance is something that in mystical arenas, you can't do very much without females present. You can't open properly without females present. You have to have women there because women are very essential to the balance that are required within the lodge room of ancient, ancient mystic groups. So he was seeking that when he began to um, develop the adoptive right. And between that, the women's suffrage and what was happening in Europe, he had a lot of inspiration on what he was doing at that time. This is the original symbol. It's so loaded. I was, I was trying not to go through, I was like so many rabbit holes here. I was like, ooh, stay focused. But then, this is the original um, logo, emble, emblem that uh, Robert Morris had for the Supreme Constellation of the American Adoptive Right. Now, when he was going around doing lectures, he was not sanctioned or, or approval was not at that point given for him to be doing such. So when he went to try to petition for this organization to be recognized, it was declined. And it was declined for a lot of reasons, which we're not gonna get into tonight. But as you can see, there are a lot of symbols here and there are probably a lot of symbols here that our brothers recognize. Um, and there may be some symbols here that other people who dive into ancient mysticism or any kind of other aspects of nature may also um, recognize. So I found that in the book, the same book that I mentioned earlier. This here is actually a plaque that I'm gonna just keep up for a little bit as I go into the, oh, let me go back. So this Supreme Constellation um, was a part of the confusion about what, as far as chapters beginning in 1850. Um, indeed, Robert Morris began to 
conferred a degree to families during lectures when he traveled in 1850, but it was under the adoptive right. And many groups formed adoptive right sort of chapters or for lack of a better word, in different states. And they then felt as though when Eastern Star was actually created, that they had kind of been the first. But as I mentioned previously, the Supreme Constellation of the American Adoptive Right was not accepted within the Grand Lodge as an affiliate or an appendant body. So it was being done independently. This is um, a slide of a plaque that was given to women who were actually very instrumental in getting the Masons, not this building, but their very first building, not too far away from here. And what they were, they were the fundraising gurus. I'm like, these are my girls, because I'm a fundraising guru too. So I'm like, okay. So they were the fundraising gurus and they were actually given this um, for their, as it says, absolutely unselfish task, the outcome of a pure desire to do good for the sake of doing good. And at this time, um, as we spoke, as I spoke about previously in 1853, Robert had just conferred the first adoptive right here in uh, New York City. And a few groups had started. And I got my Brooklyn sisters here. So chartered in January 25th, 9, 1867, Friendship Family Number 103 in Brooklyn was first organized, the first organized adoptive group in the state of New York. They hold that down. Um, they were the first adoptive group. Um, and I'm sorry, 57, 1857. Later, they were known as Esther Chapter Number Two and later dissolved into Brooklyn Number Chapter Two. However, they were the first under the adoptive rights, not under the chapter system, which there's a bit of a difference. So they were the first in New York to organize in Brooklyn. I mean, I'm from Brooklyn, so I got to give it up to Brooklyn, you know, and um, McCoy was in Brooklyn. So, you know, I got to give it up. Shout out to Brooklyn. However, <laughs> however, the Alpha Sisters Adoptive Right was, was formed in about um, during the during this fair. And um, many of them were already adoptive right holders. They had been doing um, charitable work for Masons and their husbands and sons and for various years. And they went up to Robert and they stepped to Robert actually, but it's all about who you know, right? They stepped, they stepped to Robert and was like, yo, Robert, listen, um, we wanna be organized and structured within the Masonic family. We do so much for the family. We wanna be part of the family officially. How can we make that happen? And um, basically it's who you know, Grandmaster John W. Simmons at the time, he was the Grand Master of New York in 1861. He uh, gave the nod for McCoy to start working on a chapter system. And he was a very good friend. He happened to very, be very good friends with McCoy. So um, this is Robert McCoy. And for many years, Robert McCoy actually served as a co-worker of Robert Morris, conferring degrees at arranged lodge events. Robert Morris, who became the Grand Master of Kentucky, turned over the helm to Robert McCoy, who was a New York, NYC, Brooklyn, I put in parentheses, <laughs> Mason. <laughs> um, so, to create the Eastern Star ritual, he would have had to provide a permanent organization of which their words of charity and benevolence would extend beyond the Masonic fairs. This was the ask, this was the request of the sisters. They wanted it to be beyond the Masonic fairs. And McCoy had already pre, um, penned the manual order of the Eastern Star published in 1865 by New York Masonic Publishing 
and manufacturing company. It was right here in Manhattan. Um, so in 1868, um, after the women had just kind of like been after him to get this done, he presented the first system ritual chap uh, manuscript in manuscript form. And on December 28th, 1868, alpha chapter number one, Alpha chapter number one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you, you began using the McCoy chapter system ritual and met at 594 Broadway, which was the original spot of the Masonic Hall in Manhattan at that time. And they established with McCoy as a charter member, the charter chapter and it still holds with distinction. Um, I'm just going to tag myself in here a little bit, a little bit of history. The first that ever was, was first um, presented during a floral ceremony this year. Um, as the history of Alpha has kind of been a little, so I wanted to make sure that everybody knew we were the first that ever was. And we were established in 1868 under the chapter system. There were people still doing um, what you would call Eastern Star Adoptive Rite Ritual prior to that in 1850, but they were not part of an original chapter system, nor were they part of an agreement by the Masons to accept us as a appendant body. Okay, so. This I found in, um, this is 1895 star symbol, but you know, this I found online just doing what I was doing. And this is the Indianapolis newsletter. And I actually saw how the, from the original signet that we saw in the very beginning, how the um, symbol has actually kind of variated and, and made a change and adjustment even from what we saw with the adoptive right um, piece. So I just wanted to kind of like, um, yeah, I wanted to, to highlight that. And I also wanted to shout out Miss Eleanor Burton, uh, most worthy, who was the grand matron at the time. So, yeah. And here we go. This was the original Morris Signet. And once again, I got this from the book that I mentioned earlier. And then that's the smaller version there. There is so much going on here. I'm not getting into it. But what I will say is it helped me, it helped shape my um, presentation even more when I'm talking about, when I'll be going into what I find behind the star, hidden behind the star. There's so much here though in front of the star that could take you your whole life. But for me, there's so much more behind it that I was able to connect to. And so that's what I will be sharing um, pretty much this evening. So ugh, why does our star point up? Well, yeah. So the emblem of our order is the five pointed star, as you know, and it's composed of triangles. And the triangle is a symbol of family life and the star itself within one point up is the symbol of divine providence. Okay, make sure to remember that because that'll be helpful later when I start dealing, pulling out all these symbolism stuffs. Okay, I'll repeat that. <laughs> um, the star pointing up is a symbol of divine providence. Prior to the advent of Jesus, according to ancient theologists, the theologists, the, theologians, the sun was involved in a mysteries of as power of the world, light of the world, spirit of the world. And the worshiping, and here we go, Isis, worshiping meaning reverence, meaning giving reverence to, not worshiping. Um, it was a universal, was universal throughout Egypt. And the five pointed star with the one pointing up and its middle, the face of the sun or an eye representing Osiris. The star of the pentagram, the five pointed star with one point up 
representing the God of all good and the God of immortality, became a part of the symbolic masonry and the order of the Eastern Star. In the emblem of our star, the five point triangular point of the star still remain, retains the traditional meaning of family and relationship. And this is an excerpt from inter interesting historical data by Most Worthy Ann Pond, and it is currently out of print. So in 1917, past Most Worthy Ann Pond presented a resolution for the star to be placed in its correct position, one point up, two points down. And in 1919, the parent body, Order of Eastern Star, the state of New York, we are the parent body, everyone who is legitimate came out of us in some way or fashion, um, adopted the resolution. And as the parent body of the chapter systems, it, is ex it was expected that all jurisdictions would follow. Well, did they? <laughs> no, they didn't. But that is why our star points up. Okay? And I believe this is a time for questions. Any questions? So when you stand up or you, you know, yell out, just... Say your name for me, please. Good evening, Simone. Um, Hi. I have a question. Yep. If you don't mind, can you return back to the previous slide? Um, I'm paying attention to the color scheme of the star. Besides the fact that it's pointing upwards, it made me think about the um, traditional French occult symbolism of Raphael for the gold, Uriel for the green, Gabriel is for the blue and red is for Michael. All four are the uh, archangels of the elements. Might that be involved in this symbol? This might be something that I'm going to talk about later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, yes. Hello. Hi. Um, Simone, thank you for this lecture. I do have a question. Yep. Um, my question is, I wrote it down, um, did Charlotte Morris become a member of OES and did she have any influence on the heroines? Okay. Thank you. Great question. I'm not sure if she became a member of OES because she created it. I would hope that she was grandfathered or grandmothered into it. I do know she did have a lot to do with the creation of the concept. So yes, the women, the star points, the meanings, the purpose behind it. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So I don't know if she was, what I do know, I did come across a few um, correspondence from Robert Morris to her with excitement about when he, when he was traveling and conferring the degrees and he was just kind of like, Charlotte, like, everyone's loving it, it's great, you know, like this is my version, of course, but you know, it's great and everyone's loving it. And I, you know, so I, she, I don't think she traveled with him often, but she was definitely instrumental in it. And he checked in with her quite often to let her know how things were going on the road. As a Mason husband does, right? Right, right? <laughs> do y'all stop doing that? Y'all still do that, right? <laughs> okay, so. Um, any more questions about this particular area? Yes. Yes, question, hand up, question. Okay, no questions. Yes, question. Yes. Go ahead. Hi, Simone. Michael, can you, um, five minutes? Like, I don't wanna, yeah, just let me know when five minutes have passed. I have a quick question, so I know that, um, it was discussed the colors, but I'm interested in learning more about each item inside the star. Will you discuss? So we just started and this is part one. We're going to get to it. I'm just and, so excited. Um, I just want you to, we to focus on the question, any questions you have with part one, any, any more questions with part one? I've, I have a question. Yes. So what does Robert Morris have to do with the library? 
What does Robert Morris have to do with the Livingston Library? That's correct, yes. I don't know. That's not my presentation. <laughs> 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 what, what, what's, what's really cool is that he was the one that started taking in books and artifacts to create what we know now as the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston Library. Nice. Okay. What I do know about Robert Morris is that he was an educator. Thank you for reminding me about that. He was a teacher and he quit. He quit teaching and he became a teacher within, the, um, within masonry and within the organization of masonry. So he was actually a teacher at one point before <coughs> embarking on this. And he decided, he was like, you know what, let me, mm -mm, I'm quitting. I'm gonna go on a lecture circuit. And he actually, it was quite lucrative as well because he would charge fees for his lectures. Good evening, Simone. I'm Brother Victor Scabores, petitioner for Alpha Chapter. Uh, my <laughs> question is, just for clarification, the adaptive American right was its separate entity, and then, then, then did that later become part of the OES system itself? Was it this more or less the same ritualistic basis that became the Order of the Eastern Star once it was accepted? So that's a great question. The adoptive right was originally based on the star points we know now, all of the secret information that we get as members was instilled upon and initiated, uh, not initiated, they were, it was instilled upon them, like it was a lecture. So they would stand up and they, he would lecture them, he would tell them, they would get all the information and that was pretty much it. And then people started to create adoptive right groups from that where they would continue to study what Robert had kind of laid upon them. Does that answer your question? Yes. Essentially, that is the esoteric knowledge that the Eastern stars have at, at one level, if that's what I'm gathering. OK. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Simone, Simone, can you go back to the slide with the plaque? Which one? With the plaque. So that's on the 17th floor of this building. In the library, at the library. No, no, at the front of the, uh, the, the, the Grand Secretary's office. Oh, the Grand Secretary, the Grand Secretary. Okay, well, um, I thought it was in front of the, I've seen it before here. I just didn't remember where I saw it. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, this is still here in the building on the 17th floor. Thank you for that. Any more questions? What are we doing with time? Okay, so I'm going to move on. If you do happen to have any questions in relation to this group, please make sure you reference that um, because it's going to get a little... Oh, what happened? That's not, that wasn't supposed to be the next slide. Oh, let me see something here. Oh, it didn't take my other picture. I had this nice jungle picture with all the animals and everything. So it's not there. All right. Um, so before we get into part one of the hidden star, I want to tell you a little bit about my background. Because if I don't, you're probably going to be like, but maybe you won't, but maybe I So uh, <laughs> I was raised around my immediate family. Um, I was raised around two denominations of Christianity. I was raised around Islam, Judaism, and Hinduism. So I have a very, very beautiful, unique family. And I think that we could tell people how to keep peace, but I guess no one wants to know. Uh, but to say that, to say that um, I've, my son and I, he has yarmulke, he's done Haggadah, he's done Passover, he does Ramadan, he goes to Christmas and New Year's Eve mass, he does chanting, he does meditation. We do it all. And we find the beauty in that because our family is a mosaic of people who have different beliefs. So with that, my presentation is kind of going to be that. It's going to be all over because we're, I was all over. And I'm, 
I'm really proud of that because I have an appreciation and a love for all of the religions and not a, you know, deciph deciphered affinity for one. I love them all. And I know that they can all kind of exist and coexist together because it happens, you know, in my family. So, but I had this nice little slide. You didn't have to watch me, but I, it, it didn't, uh, what's the pictures? This is the image. Okay, so there's a picture, there's supposed to be a picture here. That's not, it's not doing any of my images. What happened? Oh no, that's not good. That's not good. Can you animate? Oh, it doesn't have the, it doesn't have anything else. What we can do is sacrifice the clicker and you just go back to the PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah please. It didn't copy. Yeah. Okay. Um, excuse us for one second because there's some, you know, this is all about images, so I got to get the images together. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it didn't, it didn't download it all together? Let me see. Okay. I hope it did. It didn't? Is that the other one? Oh my gosh. Okay, this will, let's see. Yeah, it's so weird that it has all those images, but let me see if it has the other ones. Yes. Okay, great. So now just, just use this. Woo! All right. Just, just use the arrow. Okay. So this is a very blurred image of who Ada's story derives from. Um, Jephthah's daughter, sometimes known as Selo or Iphis, known to OES as Ada. Okay, she is a figure in the Hebrew Bible. How you know that? I just told you. So <laughs> whose story is in the book of Judges 11. And Jephthah had just won a battle over the Ammonites and vowed he would give the first thing that came out of his house as a burnt offering to God. And it was... Sila. And this image, which is a lot clearer, is in the Jewish Museum of New York. Ruth. Um, Ruth shows how God is at work in the day to day activities of average people. All the characters, all the characters' faces, life, all the characters face life's normal challenges and find God is woven in a story of redemption out of all the details. And she is found in the book of Ruth. Esther is a young Jewish woman living in Parisian at the time. She was very poor. And she um, ended up being in the king's favor. And one of the ways she did that was at one point, this king had all the women vowing to be, you know, that whole Cinderella story. It's not that original. This was the Cinderella story. So all the women wanted him and he just, he wasn't really, and she didn't want to have anything to do with him. And of course he was interested in that. And so they ended up getting married and she took a courageous, um, she made a courageous uh, decision to save her people by asking for him to do such. And he did. Um, don't know much about her or him. I know he was murdered. He was killed. And so there's not too much about what happened to her in the midst of wars, but it's safe to assume that she probably um, met her demise as well. This is Martha, and in the end, the far most important thing about her, I think everyone kind of knows Martha because she was the sister of Lazarus, is that she had faith in God even in some of the most tumultuous times of her life, um, particularly in the lost, sudden loss of her brother. And, and she can be found in Luke and John and um, Electa. Electa represents the ideal mother. 
She sacrificed everything to establish a Christian heritage for her children. Her name means honorable lady and called to called of God. And she is in second Episcopal of John one. Okay, so this is where I can't tell you what beyond that because that's none of your business unless you're Eastern Star. <laughs> so this is my jungle picture that I was going to show. <laughs> and so I kind of see our family like this, you know, it's like, how's the elephant there and the lion's not eating it? And how is the snake there? And then not because, you know, they just getting it long. So that's kind of how I see my family as this like wonderful jungle of animals. I love this picture. I'm glad I was able to share it with you. All right. So. The first piece that we're going to get into, um, these are my opinions and my opinions only. This is based on my research and my research only. Um, when we talk about ancient mysticism though, I did leave out, how could I leave out? The other piece of my history is Aboriginal indigenous. My great grandmother who I was able to know from like she died when I was, like a few months before I turned 10, she was indigenous, she was Geechee Gullah, and she used to tell me the stories of people and nature and how nature worked. And they're not unique to um, the world. You have aboriginals in Australia, in Canada, you have people who kind of do the same kind of things. Um, and it's so interesting because they're all spread out and it's the same kind of basic principles they do and have reverence towards nature that um, you were talking about a little bit earlier that we're gonna get into. And so my Aboriginal roots are really where I, Willie Lee Edwards, thank you so much. That's my great grandma, where I really began to explore and understand symbolism, the things I was seeing actually there was something behind what I was seeing that meant so much more. So that's how I got into symbolism. So I just wanted to shout her out. And before I go into that, just wanna be um, cognizant of the fact that we only have records for about 6,000, 7,000 years. Um, I believe in Zambia just about a month ago, they found artifacts that show human life existed at least 300,000 years ago. So when we talk about what we know now and what they knew, these are the indigenous people are some of the people that have gathered and kept that information going for all this time. And so I applaud them and I have a lot of respect for them. So let's talk a little bit about the triangles. We saw a whole bunch of these earlier. So symbolism, the triangles. Clarity of consciousness is pointing up, which we talked about a little earlier, and inspires one to act in the world and achieve tangible outcomes. Whereas when it's pointing down, it is creation and, uh, I'm sorry, inspires one to act in the world and achieve tangible outcomes is when it's pointing down and clarity of consciousness is when it's pointing up. So the symbolism of the intention of Robert was it to, to have it point down and also creation, creative spirit, knowing oneself. It also symbolizes in Hindu, how she know that? I told y'all already. It also symbolizes in Hindu, a goddess, a feminine goddess, um, and it symbolizes transformative feminine energy when pointed down, when a star, when there's one star pointing down. She's nodding. I'm doing good, right? Yeah, see? <laughs> Thank you. And, and so um, the symbolism, I, feel, I believe Robert, although he was very um, religious and, and a Christian, I also, just from the symbolism and from some of the things I've read, that he was also very mystic and very much in tune with nature. And so I do, in, I do believe that some of the pieces that I have here are some of the things that him and his wife talked about when they were developing this organization. 
but that's my belief. <laughs> so um, let's move into the flowers. Blue violet. We have flowers that represent each star point as well. And the blue violet in spiritual terms is faith, affection, intuition, and a love sign of innocence. The yellow jasmine is affection, joy, friendship, and prosperity. The white lily is rebirth, purity, grace, and abundance. Also symbol used for the Virgin Mary. The evergreen pine, it kind of says it in the words, right? It's purification and cleansing, but it's also everlasting. And I saved this one for, well, I didn't save it for last. It's actually the red rose. The red rose is the huge connection here. And since ancient times, it's been long held in uh, mystic symbol and sy symbolic power. The rose is a powerful symbol and is used in several religious and spiritual groups. It is a symbol union between the divine feminine and the masculine energies. So this rose actually represents that balance that Robert Morris was looking for when he created this organization. The stem, the soft petals are the women, of course, you know, nurturing, compassionate, and the Stems, the thorns symbolize the strength and protection associated in the masculine. And Aboriginals believe um, their women are held in high regard, first of all, foremost. They were very instrumental in the women's suffrage because the Aboriginal women, natives, were actually talking to the um, European women and let them know a thing or two about how things were kind of being run in the Aboriginal world and the balance that was there, which actually inspired them to want to move towards a women's suffrage movement to get equality here in the United States. So um, the masculine is generally in those terms the holder of the protection and the women are the intuitive, more spiritual um, individuals who are the holder of that. Not that a man, can, not that a woman can't be strong and not that a man can't be soft, but it is generally um, looked upon that a woman holds the, the spiritual keys and even in ancient days, we talk about the Delphis and you have oracles. Um, the oracles were all women. And at that point, if you wanted to speak to an oracle, you could only speak once. You can only, you know, come forth towards an oracle once and ask one question your entire life. And they would give you the information and the infinite wisdom. There were things that they did that kept themselves, kept themselves channeled and connected to the divine in that way that they would give you an answer. But, and I kind of learned this because I, I used to be a uh, teacher as well. I, I kind of like Robert, and, but um, so um, not for the kids, it wasn't them, it was, you know, anyway, that's not the lecture, Monet. Okay, so what I did was, um, when I ask, when my students ask me a question, I sometimes answered them with a question or I sometimes gave them a little bit and asked them to figure out the rest. And so that was what an Oracle did. Anyone seen matrix, right? Okay. So, you know, there was an Oracle in matrix and you know how she was, she didn't give out, she didn't give everything. So that's pretty much how the oracles worked back then as well. Um, so. We're going to move from the flowers to the auras. Okay. Blue is powerful, insightful, and unconfined. A person with a blue aura is a born survivor as they stay calm and relaxed during times of stress. And so if we can, uh, sisters here, you can think about what you know and see how it relates. Um, to that particular P 
piece that we know about. Uh, yellow, sunny, confident, and charismatic, the color of awakening, inspiration, and intelligence. Yellow auras show joy and freedom. People with this aura have inner joy and generosity. A yellow halo is a sign of high spiritual development and is something you should seek in a person giving spiritual teachings. White, pure spiritually, sound, and wise. There is a lack of mind-body harmony connection as it grows in strength before death. So white is the, you know, people kind of say they see the white light, things of that nature, or the, you know, the light is so bright. That's the pure spiritual sound and wise color. Green, loving, compassionate, and nurturing. A green aura indicates restful energy and a natural ability to heal. People like this are also often great gardeners. When someone is with, okay, that's an error. Flamingo, red, flamingo and energetic. People with strong red auras are generally oriented towards the material, the material world that is. The aura is a strong representation of materialistic thoughts as well as thoughts about the physical body. So for me, so far I've given you the triangles, I've given you the flowers, I've given you the auras. These are some ways in which the messages behind the stars speaks to me. And before we, <laughs> before we get into the questions, this is kind of, oh, good, yummy. <laughs> um, feng Shui. So we're talking about Aboriginals, Indigenous, and others, Yoruba, Wiccan, all these people kind of work the nature in that way. Um, practice the essence of nature, which is God's greatest creation. I know we think we are, but mm, I don't know. I don't think so right now. Um, so uh, God's greatest creation operates in a way that we have as a civilization, we're still working on. Okay. The five elements. So the water is a basis of purification, heal internal turmoil, and the earth, yellow, brown, groundedness, stability, potential, and stillness. The metal, which is also um, a symbolization, uh, 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 sorry, um, also associated with white, metallic. The spiritual metaphor of transforming metal into gold for obtaining spiritual enlightenment. The wood. Green, teal, Martha, protection, peace, calmness, healing, stability, growth, omnipresent. Jesus was a carpenter. I just had to put that in there. Um, <laughs> so fire, also used for purification, disperses and transforms energy. So this is the end of part one. Questions? <laughs> yes, brother. I got Michael working five minutes too. Mm -hmm. Really? What time is it? Uh -huh. okay. So three minutes then. Since you've uh, mentioned that you are into Hinduism as well, when you had hexagram on the screen and you pointed out that the, um, there is a feminine aspect involved, were you referring to Kali, Shakti, or Siddhi? Yes, yeah, Shakti. Shakti, okay. Shakti, yes. Name. Thank you. <laughs> you testing me? <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, so, brother. Uh, what's your name? I'm Roger. It's nice to meet you. Hi, nice to meet you. So my question is in regard to the first part that you have went over and this part as well. So to kind of like correlate between the two, I noticed that between two of the slides, when the star had changed from being to being upright, the colors also changed in placement. Does that have anything? Does that have any correlation behind the meanings and the placement? Do they affect each other? Because if in the first in one I don't slide. think so. Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't I don't see it that way. Yeah. Okay. I understand what you're saying. You're saying when New York decided to point the star up, did that shift it? That 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 in essence when I was talking about what points up means something, what points down means something, there was a shift. 
and even most worthy Ann Pond that I read um, her excerpt said that that shift was needed for an apparent reason. So yes, there was a shift, but there's no change in, the colors didn't change. The placement of them did. The placement does not, does not, does not have anything to do with um, changing the meanings of what I'm presenting tonight. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question. So you went, for, can you go back to the, to the uh, five elements? So I, I really love this because most of the people I talk in, the um, you are going back? Not with the you got to do the computer. Oh right! Yeah. <laughs> uh, these are the five elements in the East, and um, uh, the uh, Hindus and and the Buddhists and a lot of the mystical arts. With that, this is what I was very familiar with many many years before I came into Masons Masonry. A lot of people, a lot of people in Masonry talk about the occult. They usually use different uh, set of elements. Was there a reason why you chose these? Will you go into the others? As I chose these, uh, as opposed to. To um, usually spirit, war, uh, earth, fire, um, air, and what did I miss? Water. Water. Yeah, those are those are okay, the usual. Okay, so ones. the metal is a spiritual. So is that what you? No, mean? no, I was wondering why why you chose these set rather than the more popular occult version. Because I I, I like these. Cause, by the way, I derive from what everybody for. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, okay. Buddhism and Aboriginals. And so this is this is what I've been taught and what I know. That answers the question, thank you. Yeah, thank Anybody you. Anybody else? Anyone else have a question? Good evening, sister. Good my evening. Name is, my name is Donald. So the, the part about the oracle interested me, resonated with me deeply. So I understand you can only have one question. Well, could I, why couldn't I come to her for more guidance, even though she doesn't want to give everything? And if I couldn't come to her, who else could I go to but the female knowledge and energy? Okay. So what I think I heard you say <laughs> was the oracle, um, the, uh, potentially the, or the, particularly the oracles of Delphi, because there were other oracles before them. Um, that you could kind of go to, and those were within the Kemet practice, okay? So if that makes sense to you, there are feminine energies, and so you kind of can, um, you know, do your meditation, do your contemplation, do whatever it is that takes you where you need to go to get those answers. The other piece is why you could not go to come to them because your question had to be that important. It had to be that, like, you just couldn't keep coming. Hey, I got another question. You know, why, you know, why is it raining today? Hey, I have another. like, that wasn't, the oracles were not, they didn't have time for that. And they, and actually, they were constantly depleted because of the energy that they had to exude to actually be in a space to be out of themselves, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yes, hello, Simone. Can you go back to the five elemental slide? I wanted to make a comment and then a question. My doctorate is in, acu in acupuncture, and I've actually studied this for many years. The comment is that the five elements engender each other, so one becomes the other, um, and they progress into each other to reveal the divine all. Uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but is, am I gathering that the symbolism of the five heroines of Eastern Star and what they represent, along with their colors, it is, is it a similar thing that each of those characteristics you must engender and become so that then you can evolve the divinity within? That's what I believe. Okay, thank you. So, um, so, so that is not the opinions or the um, <laughs> the opinion. So, this is a disclaimer. That is not the opinions of the Order of the Eastern Star nor its membership. Understood. It is what so, I believe. <laughs> just to just to re, just to reiterate, um, doc, uh, Victor, as a doctor of acupuncture, these are the elements that you work with. Yes. Okay. So thank So this is part two, the seasons, water, 
um, winter and descending energy, such as fa falling rain or the lowest sea level of water in the sea, which we can't get to. If we get, we get there, we're dying. You know, you can't get down there, right? Okay. <laughs> Earth represents actually in some in some ancient you know mystical groups that is the, the that's an erogenous zone. So that area is nor is not female nor male, and it is an area in which you have to really be in your studies to get to, which is not seeing yourself as a woman or a man, but seeing yourself sort of as Prince said, I'm not a woman, I'm not a man, and I'm not trying to get us sued, but you know, that song that he makes, so sort of like that, like, like, like that, when you're in that space, you're not really cognizant, nor do you care about those pieces. So earth representing early fall and stabilizing grounding energy. Metal representing late fall and contracting energy, such as when trees lose their leaves to conserve. Wood and they're conserving because winter knocks the tree all over and the trees all over. And those leaves were there, but nature took care of that. Ain't that something? So um, metal um, wood represents springtime and uprising energy, such as plants pushing through the soil. And fire representing summer and ascending energy, such as flames reaching to the heavens. This is an aboriginal tree of life. I don't know when it was created, but it was, as you can see, it's not Hebrew language. You may not be able to see because it's kind of, it's not Hebrew language. It's, this is older than the old and the old and the old. So they were doing the tree of life kind of symbolism piece and that way before uh, it was technically uh, explored and written within the Kabbalah and Judaism. I love this because it just takes me, when I look at it, it just takes me back to my, to, to conversations with my grandmother. It just takes me back to, to that, to, to um, ancient times. And so I just kind of put this tree of life here for us to just kind of look at without the colors. And I'm sure, how many people in here are familiar with the tree of life? Okay, great, fantastic. So, this is believed to have a male side, the right side, whatever, and the right, <laughs> and a male and a female side, the left side, whatever. You know, the three upper channels are, as you can, as you know, the divine creative life force. Um, the Conscious of which you knowing divine essence is revealed to humans, the crown. So we talked about the star pointing up in this divine providence. And so that was the goal of uh, Most Worthy and I'm not sure if um, we're all there, but I know we're gonna get there one day. <laughs> um, but, and then harmony and balance in nature, rebirth and connection of the earthly and spiritual. The trees, the tree, as we talked a little bit about, symbolizes strength individually and expression, calmness, growth, and interconnectedness of everything. And the reason why that, that tree of life, just going back to it for a minute. So there's a tea tree oil, and then there's like a wood root tonic for my Caribbean people, and then there's this wood chips for other, there's just so many things that we take from the tree that help us, right? So it is really the, if you um, are into herbs and herbology, you know that there is, everything that you kind of need comes from a tree. Um, also, I just wanted to point out, cause I'm, I'm, I'm over time, right? Is there are four levels. So this, this and this, right? And then the bottom. Okay. And it's cosmic divine, 
the upper middle. Oh, the pointer. Ooh, I can use it. Okay, how do I turn it on? How do I turn the pointer on? Oh, it's the little sun button. Right here? Yeah, I tried to. Okay, thank you. So here, this level here, one, two, three, one, two, three, and then one, two, three. This level here is the crown, the divine, the cosmic divine. That is what anyone who is into or wants to know thyself, this is the goal, is to be up in this area. Um, and then here is the mental concepts and creation. It's where creativity happens mainly in these, in these three. And then here is formation. So after you have created, then you begin to, so Robin Morris was here at one point, and then he actually formed the adoptive right. And McCoy formed the chapter system rituals. And down here is the physical action. So Robin Morris went around, traveled, conferred the adoptive right degrees. Morris uh, actually developed the chapter system of Alpha Chapter one, Number One, founded when? Mm -hmm. Eight, founded when? 1868. Thank you, 1868. So these are, I'm just giving Robert Morris as, a, as an example of, you know, how we utilize this. And also, sisters and brothers, you can see the colors here. And um, I'll just look at the wisdom piece here, the mercy, the strength, the victory, and the beauty. Okay. And so last but not least is the labyrinth. And in ancient times, the labyrinth was a profound physical tool used to stimulate contemplation and transformation. The journey of life from birth to spiritual awakening to death, the labyrinth is a personal soulful experience of twists and turns, unexpected outcomes and changes in direction. As members of the Order of Eastern Star, we are given five different women, star points within the star and their journeys to lean and find inspiration as we journey through the labyrinth of our personal lives. And that, thank you for attending. Thank you. Oh no, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's, let's take